Hi. Okay, again. We're live. Are we live? We're live on Instagram. Hi. Okay. Great. All right. Cool. We are live. Hi, everyone. Um, happy Sunday. Uh, I hope you've had a really, really good week. And uh, I hope you've had a rejuvenating and relaxing weekend. Um, uh, it's very cold in Canberra today and the wind is quite strong. It's that typical dry, wintry Canberra sort of day. And um, we're here with episode five of the Sonic Alchemy um, Scent Talks, which is really exciting. And I had a lot of fun with last week's one where we talked about Winston's. And I, um, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed these talks a great deal. And I think that I'm going to continue doing them for quite a while. And I just wanted to quickly say before we get into this week's talk, um, a really, really big thank you to everyone that has been watching. Um, I, I really wanted to say thank you to everyone that comments on these videos and who watches them or just sort of checks them out to see if, if something that is interesting to them is being discussed. I, I really appreciate it. And um, thank you so much for continuing to sort of uh, follow along on my, my scent journey, which is um, uh, really exciting. And I think this is a great experience to, to sort of be able to try, try out these different ideas for sure. So today we're going to talk about um, a, a couple of really interesting things um, that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I'm going to start off by reading from the book that I read from a few weeks ago called um, The Diary of the Nose by Jean-Claude um, Elena, uh, who's one of my perfume idols that I read a lot of. And um, I've, I read a little bit from this one a couple weeks ago, I think, and I'm just going to sort of jump right into this section because it leads on in a really, really beautiful way about what we'll be talking about this week. So, um, let's start with this. Great, okay. Up until the 1970s, perfumes prided themselves on being accomplished works. They were complex rather than structured. They were piled high and a, com and a compil an accumulation, an addition, and afforded only one reading. There was a sort of pretension in this, a desire to dominate the t that tolerated no criticism. I followed this model when I composed Thirst for Van Cleef and Appels. In 1976, gorged on analysis of market archetypes, I collected, borrowed, and conflated every signal for femininity, wealth, and power into this perfume, which over time has become alien to me. I certainly do not disown it. The loving relationship I had with it lasted only the time it took to create. With successive creations, the way in which I conceive perfumes has changed. I no longer listen to the market. Creativ creativity sometime ne sometimes needs a deaf ear. I no longer pile in components. I, ju I juxtapose them. I no longer combine them. I associate them. My perfumes are accomplished perfumes, but not finished ones. Each perfume is linked to one before and the one after it already features the next. That is not to say that they are alike, but they are united by subtle connections. I never take an existing formula as my starting point. Every formula is forgotten once the creation is completed. In fact, I work from memory on variation on a few variational themes that are special to me. I try to revisit them, correct them, and take their form of expression further 
some somewhere else, in a new different direction. Some of which means I do not look for new things. Charles Trinet or Trenet if he's French, I'm not sure. Charles Trinet said that of the thousand songs he wrote, only a dozen were successes to his own ears. This approach does not imply a desire on my part to impose on people, but a constant need to awaken pleasure and curiosity and create an exchange. So I deliberately leave gaps, spaces in perfumes for each individual to fill with their own imagination. These are appropriation spaces. So that is a, a lovely little example of um, a reading that I, um, again, from this diary of a nose that I've read for, from before. Um, and um, I love that little, that little section that I just wrote is called Temperament as well, which I think is a lovely name for it. Um, it sort of explains a, a really beautiful and explores a really beautiful idea of, of, of how perfumes have changed in the last half century. Um, a lot of people don't sort of necessarily think about this, but um, every cultural change that is, that's ever happened in the last, whoop, my phone just dropped for Instagram. Sorry, Instagram. Every, um, every change in culture that has happened over the last 150 years, really, has been mirrored and accompanied by massive creative shift in the world of perfume and the world of scent creation by, by perfumers and by the, um, the people that they create perfumes for. Um, I'll, I can go into this in more depth sort of at a later video, but I think that little piece really dives into what it means to um, to try and create something that has um, discipline and structure and this idea of a clear form, which can be really hard to achieve in perfume because of how easy it is to com completely overwhelm a composition with unnecessary parts and unnecessary complexity or um, embellishment for 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 a purely decorative sake and, and not in service of something larger. Um, the reason why I picked that section as well is because I think it rolls right on to the theme that we're talking about today, which is my perfume, Portraits of a Rain God, which is one of my favourites. And um, I, particularly in that piece that I just read from, that idea of appropriation spaces is something we'll talk a lot about today. And um, because it, it fits in with that aesthetic of, of kind of minimal... Um, that sort of minimal idea that I've been exploring a lot in my work over the last year or so. So from there, I'm going to go into today's smell and tell. So for people who didn't watch the last one or the one before that, the smell and tell is like the show and tell of this of these talks, but it's with an ingredient that I use in perfume. And it's a great way to get people to understand um, perfume on like a, a micro scale. Um, because we think of it as an industry, we don't think about it as a collection of complex parts that are both, um, are, are all really interesting to talk about. And there's thousands of ingredients in perfume, and it's really, really great to build awareness about these ingredients, because every scent has a story, and, um, there is infinity in the finite, whoever, whoever said that original quote. Um, so with that in mind, today's um, special scent is, I've already put it on the scent strip, these little blotting paper scent strips. It is Himalayan cedar, Himalayan cedar wood. Um, so this is a very, very special and unique ingredient in perfume. Um, it's used to build temples in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan 
um, maybe even in India too, um, because it's uh, it's sort of Latin um, taxonomical name is um, translates into cedar of the gods um, or wood, essentially god wood. Um, I use this material in a perfume that I launched last year called Arbor. Um, Arbor meaning tree in Latin. And that's um, that was for the Arboretum, which I will talk about at some point on these on these videos. Because um, it's my best seller right now. People seem to really enjoy it, which I'm really, really thrilled about. And um, Himalayan cedar is very interesting because... Uh, Maybe just a bit of a run through on, on how it fits into the structure of, of wood oils. Um, so there are a handful of different cedar wood oils in the world that are used in perfume. So the one I talked about last week, which I used in my perfume, Winston's, is called Cedarwood Virginia, made in Virginia, the US. Um, it has its own character, unique to the, to the sort of... Um, geographical area and smells nothing like the Himalayan cedar wood. There are also, um, there's also a Texan cedar wood, a Chinese cedar wood, and uh, a cedar wood, cedar wood called cedar wood atlas, which is in, um, which is from the, the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Yeah, there are a couple other ones, but that's the, these are sort of the main ones. Um, and then there's the Himalayan one, which um, when you smell it, pure it actually has this really really curious note of um and again note just meaning um, facet it has this really curious note of blue cheese which is so so strange and um uh i find it really fascinating to um to smell a wood that kind of smells like dairy and smells like cheese um i have uh, a whole bunch of different um, concentrations that I have dipped my cedar wood oil into. So in perfume, and this is something I wanted to talk about a bit today um, without getting too technical, is um, you can take one ingredient like the cedar wood oil from the Himalayas, like I have, and you dilute it down so you combine it with a solvent of some kind. Um, and you make it weaker. And so I have here, I have a 1% a concentration of the cedar wood that we were talking about, and I have a 10%, and I have on the end here, I have a 5%. The, the reason why we do that, I it's so interesting. A lot of people, I think when they think about the diluting process, they think about it as the process of like cutting down the cost. That's not why we do it in perfume. We do it in perfume because um, as you change the intensity of the material of, of the ingredient, you change its character in a really significant way. And so as I dilute this cedar wood down, you lose that scent of blue cheese and you get that scent of the heartwood of the, of the tree, that beautiful and kind of otherworldly, warm, rough texture of, 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 the, um, of the imagined scent of that sawdust. Um, if anyone is watching who's in Canberra or planning a Canberra trip anytime soon, I'm not sure if the Arbor Arboretum is open yet, uh, open up again since the lockdowns, but I think it is. Um, you can go and have a look and a little walk through the Himalayan cedarwood um, forest part there, which is, is sort of what I did in the lead up to my creating Arbor. Um, it's an incredible thing to do on a sunny afternoon because you get this beautiful scent of um, scent of the sun hitting the trees and it's actually quite noticeable and, and sweet. Um, just a beautiful, a really beautiful tree with an incredible history in, in sort of its spiritual use um, and I'm working on a scent at the moment um, called Azra which means um, which is Arabic for um, the mysteries of existence which will feature this uh, this ingredient hopefully but 
it's very early in the days of that scent, so I won't go into it too much. Um, so that's this week's Smell and Tell. And then I'm going to now move on to the Portraits of a Rain God. Um, so Portraits of a Rain God is a scent that I launched last year. Um, it was the first release of 2019 for me. Um, it's a really tricky perfume to talk about as well, um, partly because it's very much uh, its own creation. I, I haven't really made anything similar to Portraits of a Rain God since then or before then. It's its own unique kind of style of, of, of perfume. I think that it would be really lovely to um, start it off by actually reading my friend's description of this perfume, because in the lead up to this talk, I was rereading everything I've ever written about Portraits of a Rain God, and I found my friend's description of it that he wrote for me, and um, I thought it would be really, really interesting to, to read out for you guys, uh, and then we can talk about the scent a little, a little bit more. So I'm just going to read my friend's description of it. So this is a layman's account um, of a subjective experience of, of the perfume. I was immediately enthralled by this perfume. It opened like a horsehide curtain, rough and sweet, reminding me of, of tobacco and the Bungendor leather shop. Warm and friendly, but tough too, like the handshake of your larrikin uncle. It was the same twinkle in its eye too, a glimmer of something rising up in it. Whatever it is, it is pink and transcendent. Maybe cherry or berry or plum screaming up through the uncle's iris, the unky's iris to shatter him and your entire experience of the world into myriad pieces, each with their own personality. Maybe this is the rain and the reason for the plural of portraits in the title. The scent world seems blurred as by water, reflections everywhere, an omnipresence, the fruit becomes wetter, more transparent, until it is indeed rain on my nose's tongue. Oops. But the scent of rain has a rich history and conjures up every kind, every king killed in the name of an ideal. But, with, but in the window, which is the abstraction, appears the idea of rain, of, plural, of, of plurality, of transformation, is belief. Subtly, subtlety, but quickly overwhelmed by something much more animal, a human sacrifice, the smell of fear and rutting, the instincts that drove us to explore and do strange things like plant crops and build houses. The strange, gentle, overwhelming wave of earthly experience, of earthly experience, of presence in the physical world, of over transforming, of ever transforming environmental processes is the musky three billion year outro to this scent ever evolving with the reprises of, as far as I can tell, cherry and tobacco. It smells like your mother's sweat um, and your father's shits and the joy of showing off a scar to your year four mates and getting of, the getting of which hurt so much you actually thought you were going to die. This perfume is so distant from pride, from the saccharine and cliched and contrite that it's hard to imagine it having a maker. It is nature's tears over the still body of culture. I think that's better than the original um, description I wrote from the scent, uh, which is what, what I bring to markets and what I have online, um, which is quite funny. And I love that description a lot. And when I was rereading that for this talk, it really got me thinking about about how sometimes artists, myself included, make things and don't really understand how or why they've made them or the way they've made them. They've just kind of come together um, in, in their own way. I think it's really important to, as a perfume artist, to understand the significance of the belief that 
um, that the perfumes and the art we make have a will of them of their own, and that they they don't um, they don't do kindly to being dominated over, and it's important to let your ideas form themselves and let themselves breathe. I think. Um, it's so interesting because I think culturally it's very difficult to understand in the age of reason, the age of science, um, that something in a bottle or some things in amber bottles in a dark cupboard could, could show you the possibilities that, that they have a spirit and that they have a way of wanting to be put together and that if you fight that, they will, they will, um, they'll run away. <laughs> it's an interesting idea, but I wholeheartedly believe it. And I encourage that kind of, that kind of thought, um, uh, away from the creative person as a, as a dominating force of their craft. I think it can lead to a kind of a belief in, um, as the artist, as a kind of martyr, which is a big no-no, and we need to need to get away from that as a as a culture. I think so. At the absolute heart of um, portraits of a rain god is a material called miti atar. Um, going into the description of the scent now, um, miti is a Hindi word which means soil, from what I can tell. Um, Miti Atar is um, a really interesting ingredient because, uh, so it's, it's harvested in, I believe, northern India, where they, um, they wait for a sort of, um, they wait until a particularly bad drought tends to occur. And they, then they harvest the sort of surface layer soil in, um, they're more or less harvesting clay, essentially. And then they throw that into the distillation device, which is uh, essentially a, uh, a boiling uh, sort of, uh, a, a cylinder, um, a, a copper cylinder uh, boiling device with a, 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 what's called a gooseneck um, condenser and then they'll they catch the steam from that, which they then cool, and that's how you get things like essential oils. That's a very rough way of explaining it, but that's more than enough for today. And um, they combined, so they put in clay into this distillation device with Indian sandalwood, um, which is a, a very, very big part of, of perfume as, as a whole, this, this sort of sandalwood um, world, which, um, is interesting in itself, but what they do is they've put these two things together and they extract their sense um, as as one. So it's actually in an interesting way an incredibly alchemical um, process uh, because of how um, it is the literal uniting of two of, of two physical things, which is a, really an ancient idea in early alchemy. Um, but, uh, so essentially the, the heart note of the perfume itself is, is clay and, um, the, the scent sort of, it's sort of interesting, but because it's such a simple and, and minimal scent, it has all of these different readings. Um, I forget the name of the psychological tool that was used to be used, um, when you... I guess in early psychoanalytics, where you would um, the Rorschach test sort of thing, where you'd have the ink blots on the paper on the piece of paper, and the patient just sort of says them back to you. What's the first thing that comes into your mind after seeing them? This perfume is is a little bit like that to me. I think um, I, I have left these these spaces of emptiness in the scent that. Um, that allow the, the person experiencing it to populate those spaces with their own imagination and with their own suggestions 
um, and, and fundamentally with themselves, um, which is an incredibly interesting idea. I, I think something at the heart of this is this idea of um, Western versus, versus like Japanese ideas of, of art and ideas of completeness um, in art. It's, it's so interesting to me because these ideas of, of leaving gaps in, in finished work is, is something that uh, I'm no expert of Japanese art and I'm not going to pretend to be, but it's something that they, uh, the Japanese culture has, has, um, has more or less mastered for uh, thousands of years. And if you even just have a really uh, superficial look at some Japanese painting, some Japanese calligraphy, the way that empty space is is used in their work, um, uh, sort of allowing the space, sort of bringing into question question what it means to not use all of the canvas, to let the emptiness be its own um, creative tool, to, to have its own emotional existence, is something that's so different to, to a lot of Western culture. For some reason, when I think of that, I'm reminded of my brother's, my oldest brother's, um, his first attempt in painting, he just got a, a piece of paper and some black paint and painted all the surface of the, of the page. And his, his sort of, um, what he found so satisfying about that was that there was no white left on the page. It was all black. I sometimes think about how that relates to like all of Western painting and this idea of um, of how uncomfortable it is to let um, emptiness or silence in in something like painting uh, do its part, have its have its place. Um, it's just a very interesting thing that I that I that I like to think about. And so, when I was building portraits of a rain god, the problem that I was facing using this, this MIDI ATAR, and, and the word ATAR, um, I'm not 100% sure about, but it's, it's sort of more or less only used, that's my cat, sorry guys, um, it's more or less only used uh, for the creation of specific essences in different parts of India, um, because India is sort of the same as a lot of the Middle East, they have their distinct culture of perfume and the culture of perfume art. A book that's really useful for that is called Sandalwood and, and Carry On. Carry On is in flesh, um, which was written not that long ago, but is a great introductory uh, book into like ancient Indian scent, which is really interesting. And um, so what I was finding was I, um, as I was interacting with this mediator, um, I realized that it was about as close as we can get in perfume to what's called petrichor. Um, petrichor is the scent that is released um, from uh, dry soil after a very harsh drought and when rain hits that hard soil. It's also released from rock as well. Um, Petra means stone, essentially, and ichor means the fluid that flows in the veins of the gods in Greek mythology. So um, it's, it's actually, I think, a discovery that was made by a bunch of Australian scientists in the 60s, maybe, maybe 50s, where they discovered there was this, um, yeah, this substance, this chemical being released in microscopic amounts right at sort of the edge of a drought when rain would come. Um, it's a separate sort of, we have a bunch of different smells that occur during a, sort of the summer rain sort of sense. A, a big one of the, um, one of those is ozone, which tends to happen when, um, when there's a lot of lightning, the ozone that's present at about, I guess, 12, 12 kilometers above the Earth's surface, tends to get, um, uh, I guess, diffused down in minute amounts into the Earth's um, 
um, sort of the, the general air we breathe. And so we, we're given that sort of scent, which has its own, its own smell. Um, this is a different sort of idea. This is sort of what's released when the, um, when scorched earth is, is touched by, by rain. Um, so I found it very interesting because as I was building this perfume, I realized that as soon as I introduced any new ingredient, from what I can remember, I even tried to combine some of these petrichor humid notes with, um, with like different kind of like olive accords and things, I think some different kind of floral ideas. I found that the, um, the result was automatically confusing and I was losing a lot of that, um, a lot of that, uh, that kind of humid, um, wet soil kind of note in perfume that I love and is a hard, hard note to retain in a perfume. So I, as a result of that, ended up stripping the entire perfume back over the course of about six months at the end of 2018, I think, and just had this little idea with this, this clay and sandalwood idea, which is sort of the whole of the scent. Um, as a result of that, I tend to think about this perfume as uh, kind of like a Duchamp ready-made. So um, for people who don't know, Duchamp was a French artist in the beginning of the 20th century, and he did a lot of artwork like um, a bicycle wheel upside down in an art gallery, or he just put a chair as a piece of art. Uh, he did a lot of different stuff involving cubism, and some really interesting stuff, but his ready-mades were these ideas where he would get objects as they are in the world and, and change their context in, in terms of how they relate to like modern art. Um, a lot of, uh, and I, I tend to think about this perfume in, in the same sort of way um, because of how it's, um, it's, a single, it's a single note scent and it's incredibly, um, uh, it's incredibly simple um, and, and doesn't need any more than, than it has. And um, as a result, it's incredibly difficult to talk about because there's, uh, there's a stillness and a gentle kind of ancient subtlety to it that I think is, is so interesting. Portraits of a Rain God as well is a, is a kind of perfume built from a different kind of ethos where a lot of perfumes tend to be made so that um, what will happen is you will wear them and someone will encounter you and they'll say, that perfume smells great, what are you, what are you wearing? Portraits of a Rain God is, 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 is closer to the idea where you'll encounter someone while wearing it and they'll say, you smell great not your perfume smells great. The distinction there is actually quite a big distinction. It's, um, it's the difference between wearing a perfume that, um, that imposes and, um, and, uh, and dominates versus one that is, uh, a kind of sculpture, a kind of living sculpture for the, for the, for the person experiencing it. Um, a kind of, uh, cocoon of, of, um, of tenderness, I think. Yeah, this is probably a good way of explaining it. So with that being said, uh, sort of the final thing as well that really en entranced me was at the time I was creating this, I was reading, um, Homer's Odyssey, which when I was rereading the description for this perfume, I had completely forgotten that that's why I created it. Um, Homer's Odyssey was a really unique experience for me. Um, I, I'm really, really interested in religion and and, um, and polytheism and, and this idea in, in Homer's The Odyssey for people who haven't read it is he's, um, it's an epic journey of, of sort of, uh, of perseverance and really self um, self discovery as well as this idea of he, 
the main character in the in the story is a um, is subjected in very harsh ways to very real forces of different gods. Um, and for some reason that united something very interesting in me uh, that related to um, to how, how can we go further back in scent? How do, what are the smells of pre, the pre-Christian world? What are, what are these polytheistic scents like? Um, which I think Portraits of a Rain God really, really is, is trying to sort of zoom in on in, in, a, in a way. And um, I think that's, to, yeah, I think that's about as good as I'm gonna get at explaining this, um, this, this very unique and interesting scent. I really recommend um, people who haven't smelt it yet to, to go on to um, my Etsy, which I'm going to just link on my Facebook thingy. Here we go. I think we can just, no. I'm just gonna grab the actual, um, the actual uh, link online where you can find Portraits of a Rain God because it would be great for people who are interested to be able to go to that. If you're on my Instagram, you can go on to the, um, the link in my description and find it there as well. So I've just placed the link there. And um, yeah, I, again, just thank you so much for watching everyone. If you're watching this in the future, thank you so much. Feel free to leave um, uh, any comments um, or, or questions and I can answer them later on. Um, great, I'm going to be back next week as well. I'm going to talk about a very exciting perfume that I've never released called Kuso, uh, which is a perfume based on a movie created by Flying Lotus, um, who's a really uh, one of my favorite musicians of all time. And I'm going to talk about uh, how I made a perfume that's not like, um, like poo and sweat and why, all, why did I do it and, and so a lot of fun stuff like that because we tend to forget when we work with smells that smells are fun and smells are funny and um, smells are light and uh, you, can, um, you can get a lot of enjoyment out of things that are, um, that are like that. So. Anyway, thank you again for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Have a lovely week, and I'll see you next week. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye.